So today we'll be talking about um, pre-processing and feature engineering, and uh, mostly about uh, sort of relatively introductory and basic ways to do feature engineering. Most of the things I'm talking about today applies mostly to things like linear models, port vector machines, and neural networks. It doesn't apply so much to trees as they treat data uh, quite differently from the other models. But this is, all of this is pretty basic feature engineering and pre-processing that you should definitely be aware of. What is appropriate for what model? Um, it depends obviously on the model and we'll go through this as we go through the models. Before I get started, I want to uh, open up with this quote by Andrew Ng. Uh, Coming up with features is difficult, time consuming, requires expert knowledge. Applied machine learning is basically feature engineering. So I didn't know that quote when I named my lecture, but according to him, this is the only lecture you have to attend. Um, this is the only applied machine learning here. So um, there's one data set I want to start working with as an example. This is actually quite a nice toy data set, and so it isn't as bad as most other data sets. It's the Boston housing data set, where the goal is to predict the prices of houses in Boston neighborhoods. And so here, this is a plot that shows all of the 13 features plotted against the target, which is the price. So MEDV is the median value, and here you have uh, crime rate, industrialization, whether it's on the Charleston River, uh, nitrogen dioxide, I think, um, age of the house, number of rooms, and so on. And when you look at this plot, you can already see that these different features have lots of different properties. So most of them are continuous. This one here is 0 or 1. You can see that there's like some uh, more, or less sorry, more or less linear relationships, some lo less linear relationships, maybe some that don't have a clear relationship. And they also have very different distributions. The first thing I want to focus on is scaling of the data. So as you can see here, if you look at the x-axis ticks, they have very different scales. So here the tax that's paid is between 200 and 700, or even, even above, whereas this is an indicator variable, so it's 0 or 1. And so for a lot of models, this would be actually quite problematic, and so the first thing I want to talk about is scaling. So you can see this a little bit uh, more clearly, maybe looking at um, box plot, so here I use a pandas box plot, and you can see even more clearly that the variance of some of the um, variables is quite different, and the scale is quite different. You can also see that most of them are not normally distributed, they're skewed in some way or another. So to illustrate why the scaling is important, I want to go back to the model we talked about on Monday, uh, the Kenyan's neighbors. So here, I have my favorite toy data set again that we saw on Monday. Um, so on the left-hand side, I changed it a little bit. Um, I changed the scale of the x-axis. Let's say I did a change of units and it was in uh, meters and I went to millimeters. Obviously, that shouldn't change the data. So we would hope that the algorithm works uh, no matter what unit I cho choose. And so now I apply Kenyon's neighbors to this. On the right hand side, I have the same data set, exactly the same, only added zero mean unit variance to scale the data. Okay, so any expectations on what's gonna happen if I do K and N on both of these? So if I look at the data set with, where the two axes have very different scales, so again, this is a plot similar to what I showed on Monday, where the background color says what class is a point here according to the model. And so without scaling, the model basically ignores the y-axis because Euclidean distances that I'm using here um, are very different along the y and the x-axis. So on the x-axis, a difference between here and here is like in the hundreds, whereas the difference between here and here it in the, on the y-axis is only like two. And so this two doesn't matter at all compared to the hundreds on the x-axis. And so even though the data looks exactly the same, the results are quite different. 
usually we don't really know a priori which features are important. If you know that for your data set only the y-axis is important, the x-axis is not important, or the other way around, um, well, maybe then don't include the one that you know is not important. So uh, it's very rarely useful to have them be on different scales because it will implicitly assign different importances to the different features. And they can be determined by something arbitrary like what kind of units do I use? There's uh, quite a few ways to scale your data. The most commonly used one is the set what's implemented as standard scalar in scikit-learn, also called uh, z-score, which is zero mean unit variance. Here in this illustration, I again have a two-dimensional data set. I just colored it so we can see what's happening a little bit more. So this is our original data set. What the standard scalar would do is subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation along both axes and so we have zero mean unit variance. This makes obviously sense if we have something like Gaussian data that we normalize to Gaussian. It generally relatively useful for um, most data sets and it's what I would do by default. Um, a different scaling is min-max scalar that scales between a minimum and a maximum value. Usually it's between zero and one. That's the default in scikit-learn. Some people use between minus one and one. And um, so you can configure that. This is actually sort of different from the center scalar and it's more useful if you have fixed boundaries. If you imagine having Gaussian data and scaling it between zero and one, then the scale depends a lot on what you sampled on the tails. Like if you sample one more very, very rare point somewhere out there, it will squash the whole Gaussian together. So doing a min-max scalar on something that's Gaussian distributed doesn't really make a lot of sense. But if you have a fixed range of values, say between one and 100, it makes sense to bring um, this range of values to be in between zero and one. So min-max scalar is mostly um, useful or sensible if you have a fixed range. Of course, always you can try both and see which works better. Um, two other ones that are uh, somewhat commonly used are uh, the robust scalar. This is basically the same as a standard scalar, only it uses a median and quantiles. This might be useful if you have very strong outliers or if you suspect you have strong outliers. If you have some data here and some other data away over there, then the data way over there can pull away the mean and can increase the standard deviation arbitrarily much. With the robust scalar, some outliers will basically not change the result because they don't change the median and they don't change the quartiles or quartiles. Finally, something that's uh, most commonly used with uh, count data is the normalizer. The normalizer works on each row individually so it's somewhat different in that it doesn't estimate something from the data set. So the others, they estimate the mean or the max or something from the training data set. The normalizer just divides by the sum. So, oh, here I showed an uh, image uh, uh, showing by the Euclidean length of um, each row. That's um, basically a projection to the circle, as you can see here. And if you just want to know the direction from zero and the length doesn't matter, this is useful. You can also do this not with the Euclidean length, but with um, the L1 norm. That's just, if you have some, that's just dividing by the sum of absolute values. So that this would mean going from having counts of things to going a histogram that's normalized. So if you c count, um, things and you're only interested in the relative counts, not in the absolute counts, using a normalizer would make sense. But it's sort of more special case. Whereas standard scalar and min-max scalar are very, very commonly used. Um, in your experience, how uh, important is it to do scaling after splitting the training set of data versus before? Okay, so the question is how important is it to do scaling after splitting into test, uh, test and train data rather than before. So I think in practice, it's actually not that important. 
but I highly encourage you to do it. And actually, we're going to talk about this in depth today. Uh, the reason why is that, OK, scaling is like a relatively harmless operation. But if you do other pre-processing steps that are, um, say, more invasive or extract more information, then uh, you can overfit the training data a lot. And so I want you to adapt good practices to put all the pre-processing within the cross-validation. So for scaling, it probably doesn't matter that much. But it's just good practice to put all the pre-processing you do. And scaling will not be the only pre-processing to put all of it um, inside um, your train test split or cross-validation. So on some slides, I think on Monday, I scaled before splitting. And sometimes when I like, want to make something short for a slide, I might scale something before splitting. Um, and it, Estimating the mean is like a, like if the mean of your training data set is very different from your mean on your test data set, that's something that's kind of fishy. So one thing I wanted to note is um, you can't really do the, most of these with sparse data sets. So sparse data sets are those that are mostly zero. Um, you get this in, um, Te and text processing a lot. You get this in uh, genetics a lot. And um, depending on how you do time series, might happen in time series. And so if you have a lot of zeros, you usually don't want to store all the zeros. You only want to store the ones. And um, if you, often you can't even store all the zeros. So you have a data set that's like has 100,000 features, but only two of them are non-zero. If you, you can't really store the 100,000 zeros for every row, this would blow up your RAM. But, so now if you want to scale this, you can't actually subtract the mean, because the mean would be non-zero. And so you would subtract the non-zero number from all the zeros. And then everything would become non-zero, and then your RAM would blow up. So one way to work there, there are several ways to work around this. One is to actually do the mean computation inside your machine learning algorithm. Um, that's not really supported in scikit-learn, and does also works only for a couple of algorithms. Uh, another way is only do the scaling, don't do the centering, so don't subtract the mean. If you multiply zero by anything, it's still going to be zero. So you can use the max app scaler in scikit-learn that will just do the scaling, um, but it will not do. It will not shift the mean. Sorry, it will not shift the zero around, so it's going to be sparse again afterwards. All right, so let's do a um, simple example with the standard scaler. So here I'm using this Boston housing data set that I showed before. It's built into scikit-learn, and I'm using a linear regression model called Rich. The details of Rich are not super important right now. Um, we're going to talk more about it next Monday. So here I split my data training, sorry, I split my data set into training and test set. The standard scaler, like all models in scikit-learn, is a Python class. I instantiate the Python class. Then I call fit on the scalar object with the training data set. Here fit just means computing mean and standard deviation on the training data set. Then I can call um, transform on the train data set. This will subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. So this is the scale data set. So transform is one of the core methods in scikit-learn. There's fit, predict, transform. And I'll summarize this in a bit. So now I want to fit my uh, regression model. So I instantiate the rich model. And I fit it with the, trained, sorry, with the scale training data set and the training labels. Then I scale the test data set. And then I evaluate the model on the scale test data set. This would be a, a very standard workflow. So one thing that's important here is that we call fit only ever on the training data set. This means we compute the mean of the training points and then use the mean of the training points both for the training points and for the test points. And similarly, the standard deviation is only computed on the training points, and then the same transformation is applied to the test points. That's quite important, because if you apply different transformations, then weird things might happen. 
I want to illustrate this a little bit more using the min-max scalar. So here, say we have this uh, beautiful data set. Uh, in blue here, we have the training set, and in red, we have the test set. So let's say I want to scale this with the min-max scalar. The min-max scalar will, train, will scale it between 0 and 1. If I scale it properly, meaning I call fit on the training set and then transform on the training and the test set, this will happen. Everything will be scaled between 0 and 1. So I computed the max, minimum and maximum on the training set, so that it was like minus 6 and 15 here, and I brought the minus 6 to 0 and the 15 to 1. What you can also see is that on the test set, the minimum and maximum are not actually uh, 0 and 1. If I would apply the scalar separately to training and test sets, if I would call fit again on the test set, what would happen is that um, the test get, uh, set is scaled independently. And so it would scale a test set so that the minimum on the test set is 0 and the maximum is 1. And so you can see the effect here, which shows that now there's a shift between the training and the test set. So here, these two data sets, after scaling, it looked exactly the same, which it should. Only the scales changed. But if I scale them individually, then um, the test points move around, and they don't really correspond to the training points anymore. OK, the question is, if I just do it beforehand, I won't have this problem. That's true, but that's not a good way to do it. Because um, as I said, for scaling, it's not that big an issue. But for other operations we're going to look at, it might be more of an issue. The real fix is never call fit on any test data. Then you're fine. OK, the question is, um, do I need to scale my target? Uh, no, because that it depends a little bit on the model, but here it doesn't actually matter. So the, the math stays the same. Um, I guess if it was like had very very giant ranges, you could have numerical instabilities. I don't think we scale it internally. For some models, uh, for stability reasons, we scale it internally. I don't think we do that in Rich. But this is basically nothing you have to worry about with scikit-learn. If you don't scale the if you don't scale x, the problem is a different problem. The optimization problem is a different optimization problem. And depending how you scale, the outcome will be different. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you, you could scale y, but it would not change anything. OK, the, the change between here and here is here I call fit on the training set and transform on the training set and then transform on the test set. Here I called fit again on the test set. I called, yeah. I called fit on a training set and then transform on a training set. Then I called fit on the test set and transform on the test set. The lesson is never call fit on the test set. I'll, I'll come to the splitting and uh, the uh, preprocessing later, OK? Um, so briefly, um, I want to uh, revisit the API. So these are the methods, um, just in case you forgot, uh, that are really central in scikit-learn. So all models have fit. If they're supervised, they have x. Or OK, no, sorry. They always have x. If they're supervised, they also have a target y. If you want to predict an outcome, this is usually a one-dimensional vector that looks something like y, uh, either in classification, regression, or in clustering, then you use the predict method. If you want to create a new representation of your da training data, or of your data, um, that's in preprocessing, dimensionality reduction, feature extraction, and feature selection, then you call transform. So the outcome of transform is usually a two-dimensional array of features. So 
So these uh, three are really the core methods. There's um, two shortcuts that I often use, fit transform and fit predict. Uh, they're mostly computational shortcuts. Um, for some models, I don't think we're gonna talk about any of them. Um, there's actually a difference, but for example, if you compute principal components, you need to co compute a projection to um, get the components. So in fit, you do all the work of transform. So doing it ag again in transform is sort of a waste of computation. Also, it's shorter to write. All right, so here I'm actually um, scaling before doing the splitting or before doing the cross-validation. Um, but uh, I do this mostly to illustrate a point here. So here I'm using the rich model again. Rich CV is actually something that does some internal tuning, but it's a linear regression model. And I compare doing it on the training set and on a scale training set. And you can actually see oops, that um, they're quite, quite similar. So the rich model here doesn't care so much about the scaling. The nearest neighbor regression model, though, um, cares a lot. And you can see that after scaling, the results get much better. So we go for, this is, an, uh, is R square for regression. So higher is better and one is perfect. And so you can see there's quite a difference between not scaling the data and scaling the data. All right, so now I want to talk about um, why we should do pre-processing after the splitting. This is, as I said, not as much an issue for scaling, but if you do other, uh, other um, pre-processing things like principal component analysis or, say, feature selection. I hope I have the feature selection example in there. No, I don't. That's great. Okay. So if you, for example, if you do feature selection, it's very, very bad if you do this um, outside of um, the splitting and you will get way too optimistic results and you'll overfit your data a lot. And so here I use scaling as an example, even though this is not um, that much of an issue with scaling, but just out of principle. So let's say either I do my splitting and validation and training set, I do single split into, or I do cross validation um, either way. <coughs> Uh, during the if I do it during the validation, I fit the scalar on the whole data set, and then I fit, say, my support vector machine on um, the scaled training set, and I predict on the scaled validation set. And then I measure how well does the model do. Now, let's say I put it into production. If I put it into production, now the setting will be different. I won't have the data that I'm seeing in you uh, in the training set. So the scalar will not be fit on uh, the new data that comes in. And um, now I fit, again, my model on the whole training set, the training and validation set, fit the support vector machine, predict here. And you can see that there's sort of an asymmetry um, in how things were fit. In particular, you're leaking information from the validation fault to the evaluation on the validation fold. So either fold or split, depending on whether you do cross-validation or just a single split. So this means whatever uh, evaluation you did here will be too optimistic. So to prevent this, what you should do is um, always only fit things on the training data set and uh, evaluate on the validation data set. And then if you go to your production system, you fit your scalar on the training and validation set and um, evaluate on the new data. And so the situations will be exactly the same and the validation set will behave exactly the same as your test set will uh, in production. So in particular, um, if you do feature selection this way, if you do feature selection um, before you, Outside of the cross-validation, you will, might get very, very optimistic results. There's a great example in Elements of Statistical Learning that shows you can perfectly learn completely random data. 
So even though in reality it's impossible to learn it, your cross-validation will say you learn it perfectly. Um, this is a little bit of a constructed example, but in general your results could be much more optimistic if you do pre-processing outside of cross-validation or outside of your validation split. All right, so how are we going to do this now with scikit-learn? The answer to this is uh, pipelines. So if you do this with a single split, this is easy. If you want to do this in cross-validation, it's not sort of obvious. And pipelines help you to do this within cross-validation. So here's how pipelines work. So above, I have, uh, again, the same workflow that I showed earlier. I fit my scalar, and I scale uh, training data, and I fit the regression model, and I scale the test data, and evaluate the test data. Using pipelines, I can basically chain these two steps, the scaling and the regression model. I get a pipe. This pipe object here is a single scikit-learn uh, estimator, a single model that implements now both of these steps. And I can just call fit and score here. And it will um, do exactly the same as the code above. And not only is it shorter, also I can now put this pipeline object into cross-validation or grid search or whatever I want to do. And it makes it harder or basically impossible to write code that leaks information. Of course, it's very clear where the training set is and where the test set is and where I call fit on. So maybe to step into a little bit more detail on how this pipeline works. So there's, um, yeah. um, the easiest way to uh, create a pipeline is using the uh, make pipeline helper function. And so what it gets is a couple of transformers, as many as you want, and then in the end, usually uh, some classifier or regression model. That's kind of optional. The only thing that is actually required is all steps, but the last step have to be a transformation. Why? Because all of the steps need to transform the data to put into the last step. So for this example here, Let's say I have a transformer T1, say scaling, a transformer T2, say um, mutation of missing values, and then a classifier. If I call fit on the data set X, Y, what will happen is first internally we'll call fit on T1, my scaling, then it will call transform on T1 and give me some scale training data set X1. Then it will use the scale training data set X1, fit T2 say the imputation. Then it will use uh, t2.transform on the scaled data, get my scaled and imputed data, x2. And then I use the uh, x2 to fit the classifier. And I just realized I'm violating O'Reilly's copyright. I had to fix that. Oops. Someone of the O'Reilly people added the shadows to these boxes, so I don't have a copyright to this one. Damn. Anyway. I think this is, yeah. Um, is it? Okay, ne okay never mind. Um, so then, during prediction, uh, what happens, I call predict on x prime my test set. Uh, first, I use the first transformer. I get x, pri x prime one, then I use the second transformer, x prime one. And then I call uh, predict on x prime 2 and get my prediction. This is sort of relatively straightforward. This is sort of what you would expect to happen. Questions about this? Are we able to write our own T1 and T2 for this part? The question is, uh, are, we, are you able to write your own T1 and T2? And the answer is yes. They need to be scikit-learn compatible, so they need to have a certain API. Actually, it's a good idea. I'm going to add a lecture on how to do this. Um, it's something that's very, very commonly used. Basically, in whatever um, company or lab you go that use scikit-learn, they will have a library of their own uh, transformers uh, that's specific for how they do their pre-processing or their data loading or whatever they do. So it's, it's very, very common, and scikit-learn tries to make it easy. 
there's a couple of things, so maybe it's good if we do a lecture about that. question was, is there any reason not to scale your data? Um, if you, your model doesn't care, like if you have a tree-based model, it's kind of wasted computation. And I mean, in theory, there could be some numerical issues somewhere lurking, which is unlikely. So I mean, there's not, you might do extra work that's not required. It's unlikely to give you a bad result. It might make it harder to interpret, maybe. So I wouldn't scale if there's no need to scale in the math. Um, why do you need to transform the class? Oh, here's uh, two different transformations. Say one is scaling, one is missing value imputation. I just want to illustrate you can have as many steps in the pipeline as you want. Well, th that's sort of the standard thing you do in supervised learning. Most commonly, you do some transformation for pre-processing, and then you have a supervised model in the end. The pipeline works no matter what. You can do many things with it. Just the most common setup is that um, you, what you want to do is you want to do some supervised tasks. You want to do some classification or regression. And before you do that, you have some pre-processing steps. All right, so there's another way you can make pipelines. So make pipeline, oh. Sorry, yeah. I have a question on this. So um, like the second transformation takes the data from the, the first result, right? Yes. Um, is there a best practice for like the order of the types of transformations you should make? Okay, the question is, um, is there best practices for the order for transformations? And that's very hard to say in general, it depends a lot on your steps. But say if you have, um, if your second step depends on the scale of the data, or okay, let's say if your imputation step depends on the scale of the data, you want to scale it first. If you're scaling, can't handle missing data, you need to impute the missing data first. Um, yeah, it depends. <laughs> Yes. So, do you have a question, or is it? Okay. The the you, the comment is um, you, you only transform. Because here, uh, there's like py dot fit x y, but in below it says py transforms x y. Yes. Okay. So the question is, uh, why are we transforming only x and not y? And that's basically scikit-learn API. There's no, you cannot change Y in a pipeline. And transform never takes Y. And um, there's lots of arguments about whether that's a good idea. I think usually it's a good idea. You don't want to take your targets. You don't want to mess with what your desired output is. Um, and there's way, if you want to mess with it, you can mess with it explicitly. But there's actually very few applications where you want to do pre-processing uh, pre on Y. And there's other ways to do this in scikit-learn. There's a target transformer which allows you to do that. But okay, some people would say, for historical reasons, we don't allow this here. All right. Now I'm way behind. Great. Um, so there's another way to create pipelines. So the make pipeline is basically just a convenience function for um, instantiating the pipeline class, so you can also instantiate the pipeline class directly. The pipeline class gets a list of tuples, where tuple is the name and then the actual estimator. So here, for example, I create a pipeline of a standard scalar I call scalar, and a k-neighbors regressor that I call regressor. If I use the make pipeline function, what's happening is it just takes the lowercase class name and uses that as the name. If there's multiple classes that have the same class name, it just enumerates them like scalar one, scalar two, scalar three, and so on. So this is sometimes nice if you want to have like short, short names or more semantic names. 
All right, so now that we did this, we can um, put this into, say, cross-validation as I did here. So you can just uh, use cross val score on your pipeline, and then it will do the scaling inside the cross-validation loop. And th that's what I would say is best practice to do all the pre-processing within a pipeline, then put the pipeline in the pre-processing in the cross-validation. So this way, there, there's no way that you can leak any information in the pre-processing. So now let's say I want to do um, grid search. I also can do grid search over pipelines. And um, so here I make a pipeline of the center scalar and the K neighbors regressor. And then I put this pipeline in the grid search object. Now if I want to search the parameters of this, I need to tell um, the pipeline which parameters I want to tune or the grid search. Well, I need to tell it both. And um, the way this works is I specify the name of the step. So here, because I use make pipeline, the name of the step is just a lowercase class name. Double underscore, oops, name of the parameter. So this step name double underscore is like a syntax that you'll see in a couple of places in scikit-learn. It's just sort of a special syntax. This way, we can um, tune the parameters of any step of the pipeline. So if the pre-processing step also has parameters, I can select, uh, I can grid search the parameters of the pre-processing step. I could even, if I wanted to, use this and select which classifier or which scalar I want to use. Unfortunately, I, I just realized I don't have a slide on this. You can look the examples up on scikit-learn uh, on the website. You can basically just say, um, the second step of my pipeline should be k-neighbors uh, regressor, or should be rich, or should be random forest regressor, or something like that. And so you can have grid search automatically pick the model for you. Of course, if you do this, your search space in the grid search becomes bigger and bigger, and it will take longer and longer. Okay, questions about this? Um, okay, the question is, how do you make the pipeline? Actually, it doesn't matter what you put into the pipeline in the beginning, is the, is the answer. You can, you can either, you can put none in if you want. You can either put none in or any classifier, doesn't matter which one, and the grid search will replace it with whatever you're searching over. But that, that's a little bit weird because we added this later on, but yeah, you can put in nan or pass through. None, not none, none. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about uh, dealing with uh, discrete features or categorical variables. They're actually very, very common, but uh, scikit-learn doesn't explicitly, sorry, doesn't implicitly deal with them. It requires you to tell it what to do with it. In R, there's lots of models that basically implicitly do something to the categorical variables. Uh, Scikit-learn requires you to do everything manually, but it also gives you more control over what's happening. So here's an example of a categorical variable in the pandas data frame. So let's say you have a couple of people and you have uh, which borough they live in, and from that you want to predict whether they're vegan or not. So here, the, input, the categorical input variable would be borough, and we can see that it has values Manhattan, Queens, uh, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx. And this would be like a binary classification problem. So as I said, we expect our features to be real numbers. Uh, Manhattan and Queens are not real numbers, so we need to convert them into some number in some way. The maybe first idea you could have is what's called ordinal encoding, which is just number them. So here, um, you can do this with scikit-learn. Here's, I did it with pandas um, by saying, well, make it uh, a category, and then for the categories, get the category codes. And this is for ordinal. So here, it alphabetically numbered them, starting with Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens. So now I have a real number that represents this, uh, this feature, and I could uh, learn a model on this real number. 
And sometimes that's uh, okay, but usually it's not a great idea. The reason it's not a great idea is that this imposes an ordering. So now here I plotted this feature, where on the x-axis I have the feature, and on the y-axis I have a zero and one vegan or not. So this is like the feature versus the target. If you look at the data, um, you can see you're vegan if and only if you live in Brooklyn. And so this should be something that's easy to learn, right? But um, if you look at this, this actually makes it hard to learn for, say, a linear model. If I lay a linear model would get only this one input feature, and there's very little a linear model could do on this, and so what it would learn is something like this. And so, so now I would say, a, um, if you live in Brooklyn or Bronx, you're vegan, if you're in Manhattan or Queens, you're not. And this is not a good solution, right? If you have a more complex classifier, you could still learn this. Um, so if you use a tree-based model, for example, um, you could probably still learn something from this, but it's not ideal. Also, you can see that this depends on the ordering that I gave. So the numbers actually matter. So if I would change the alphabet or I wouldn't use alphabetical ordering, I would have different classification outcomes. There's no natural way to order the boroughs so this ordering is very arbitrary. So instead of doing this, what um, is the most common solution to this is what's called one-hot encoding or dummy encoding. In dummy encoding, I add a new feature or new column for each possible value of my categorical variable. I can do this using um, get dummies and pandas, and I'll, we'll talk about how to do this in scikit-learn in a little bit. So now here I have new columns for borrow being Bronx, borrow being Brooklyn, borrow being Manhattan, que and Queens. And um, only it's called one hot because for each fe original feature, exactly one of the new features will have a one. So if for the data point zero, the borrow was Manhattan, so Manhattan will be one, and the other ones will all be zero. For data point uh, four, it was Brooklyn, so Brooklyn will be one, all the others will be zero. If you use the get dummies on the pandas data frame, so you can see it, it changed uh, the borrow, but it also changed the vegan. Um, by default, get dummies encodes everything that's either of D type object or of D type categorical. Here, the content was strings. Strings are of D type object in pandas, so it, uh, both of these were encoded. We actually don't want to encode our target. We can keep the yes and no for uh, being vegan or not. So one way to specify which columns you want to select or want to do uh, the dummy encoding with is the columns keyword of get dummies. So here I say only encode uh, the column borrow and then vegan stays vegan and uh, borrow ex expanded into four different variables. This is also helpful um, the other way around. If, let's say, someone already used ordinal encoding, often if you get a data set, a categorical variable is already expressed in integers. So let's say someone uh, numbered the boroughs from 0 to 3, but you know this is a categorical variable. I want to one-hot encode this. Again, you can use the columns keyword to say, I know uh, borrow is a categorical variable, even though it's an integer. Please encode this for me. And I get the same result, only now they're called borrow zero, borrow one, borrow two, borrow three. So imagine that um, instead of trying to predict if someone is vegan or not, you're predicting their salary, and or salary is another feature. So by default, get dummies would not do anything on this. But in this case, we probably want to one hot encode borrow, not salary. And um, so you could set columns equal to borrow. But a priori, it's not really clear which integers are, are um, categorical, encode categoricals and which integers encode continuous data. And that's usually up to the semantics of the column. So the only way that I know that this one is categorical and this one is continuous is the headers here. 
So if you, unless you know what the semantic is of a particular feature, you don't know how you should encode it. So if someone gives you an integer, there's basically no way for you to tell whether it should be uh, categorical or continuous. There's another thing you should keep in mind, which is um, if you do this and um, so you called get dummies, you got your new dummy encoding. So now someone gives you a new file with uh, new people and you call get dummies again. So let's say you had this data set and then you have this data set and you call get dummies on both of them. And this is your training data set, you build your model and then you put in the new data. However, there's not actually four boroughs, there's five boroughs. And uh, Staten Island wasn't in your training set, but Staten Island is in your, te in your test set. Now, um, if you call get dummies, what will happen is that the last column now actually corresponds to Staten Island, not to Queens. It could be even worse. If Staten Island was uh, at the beginning of the alphabet, then all of the columns will have a different meaning now. So um, one way to get around uh, this issue is, I mean, you could call get dummies on your whole data set. That there's actually no, uh, no issue with leak information here um, because if something's not in the test set, you can't learn anything about it. Um, so you could ca call get dummies on the whole data set, but often um, you can't do this because like the test data arrives later you're in a production system and someone gives you more data. And so you don't have all the data at once. One way to um, get around this with pandas is using categorical variables or the categorical D type. So here, instead of using strings, so I instantiate the thing the same way I did before, but now instead of using strings, I convert this variable or this column to be a pandas categorical and that tell it the categories are actually these five categories. And so, even though in a training data set, there's um, no Staten Island, it will still add a Staten Island column because it knows that Staten Island is one of the possible categories. Clearly, if it's not in a training set, you can't learn anything about it, but um, if you just call get dummies and you don't care about the lining up, things just might go horribly wrong for everything. And so fixing the categories in your categorical variables is a way to uh, prevent that from happening. Is there a reason why Manhattan is then borough twice in the data frame? No, th this, is, this is a data frame, this is my data. It's not, and Brooklyn is also, it's like people that live somewhere and have some salary. So this is my data. Wait, and here it's, this is the category, the list of categories. So in the case that Staten Island was not a category that you knew existed, but later, you know, you decide to expand or something, then you kind of just have to redo the whole thing. So the question is, um, if we don't know that Satan Island exists, what, what can I do here? Um, actually, I don't know what Pandas does, but I'm gonna show you what you can do with scikit-learn um, in a second. So it's very often that maybe in the test data set there's a new category. Y you cannot learn anything about this category, obviously, but you want your model not to crash and burn. So, um, and yeah, that's what's next. Where am I? Here. All right, so the, the second learn way to do this is the one hot encoder. And we changed the interface of the one hot encoder. I'm gonna briefly show you the old way and then I'm gonna show you the future, the new way, which is the current way in 0 0.20. So the old assumption was that you have things actually already encoded as integers, which is very inconvenient. So here I have the boroughs already encoded as integers so 0, 1, 0, 2, 2, 3 are my borrows. And now I can do one hot encoding with the one hot encoder by specifying which columns are categorical. 
And so here, say categorical features ugh, is zero. So this is, would be the zeros feature. It also very inconvenient because I would need to know which column index it is. And from this here, it's not very obvious which column index it is. Um, the benefit of doing it with scikit-learn is scikit-learn has fit and transform, so it has the concepts of a training data set and a test data set. So you can automatically determine the categories from a training data set and apply them to a test data set. If something new happens within a test data set, you can ignore it, or you can give a useful warning. Whereas uh, if you call it get dummies with pandas, you might just get garbage results. Um, the new way is actually this. So the new column transformer has no categorical columns feature. It assumes that all the columns you give it are categorical. So here I have the same data frame again, but now it can, this, the new version can work on strings. So here, now I have this same data frame. I put it through the one hot encoder and I get this, this guy here. What you can see is it assumed everything was categorical. In particular, it assumed the, uh, the salary was categorical and has like six different categories. And you can see it added six different columns corresponding to the different values of the salary. This is not what we wanted, clearly. So the way to do this correctly in scikit-learn now is the following. It is using what's called column transformer. So here's an example of the column transformer. Similar to the pipeline, the column transformer allows you to put together um, several transformations uh, into a single model. Only the column transformer transforms certain subsets of the columns using a certain transformer. So let's say here I, I know that I have some categorical and some continuous features, which is usually the case in my data. Here I, I uh, create an indicator that says Okay, everything that's the type object, I assume these are categorical. Maybe I'd, I can also just specify a list of, I know these columns are, columns are categorical, these columns are continuous. This is something, as I said, I need to specify. There's no way to automatically determine this from the data, really. And now I create a uh, column transformer. Again, there's a class and a helper function, uh, like with pipeline. So here I use make column transformer, and I give it a list of or sorry, I give it two poles, which are the transformations followed by the columns I want to transform. So here, categorical is a Boolean mask, and I say everything that's not categorical, so Boolean negation, um, I, I want to apply the standard scalar, and everything that's categorical, I want to apply the one-hot encoder. So this is now, does the right thing on the right columns, and now if I want to put this together with a model, I can put this in a pipeline uh, say with logistic regression or any other regression model. So now I would have all the pre-processing steps inside the si and the final model inside the single thing that I called model. Um, maybe to go over this again with a, a quick schematic. So let's say here I have my data, which is like you have the samples are the rows and the features are the columns and I have two groups of features, say continual and continuous and categorical. It doesn't have to be continuous and categorical, you can do any subsets of features that you want, but this is the most common case. And so in the column transformer I can basically apply different transformations to these different subsets. Let's say for the continuous I want to apply standard scalar, which will produce some transform output. And let's say I also want to get PCA. So I take the same continuous uh, columns and apply PCA. And then for the categorical, I want to use one hot encoding. And so internally, the uh, column transformer does all this uh, fit and transform internally, and then concatenates horizontally uh, the results. This is, again, this adds a little bit of complexity, but it's quite nice because it's very flexible and allows you to express um, all the steps of your machine learning pipeline in a single scikit-learn object. Um, will the pink and the brown part be redundant variables because they all come from the same group of continuous 
uh, the question is, are the pink and the brown part redundant? And it depends on your model. So uh, what I uh, wanted to illustrate was that you can apply different transformations. And so let's, let's say you assume that adding the principal components help for your model. Let's say if your model is a tree-based model, these are not actually redundant because it allows the tree to grow in different ways. I'm not saying this is a good thing to do in general. I just want to show it as an illustration. If you use a linear model, it's actually going to be kind of redundant. Um, this is more like an illustration. You can apply whatever you want, and you can reuse the same columns multiple times. Just because it comes from the same columns doesn't mean it's redundant, because you could extract different aspects of the data. Okay, the question is, what if there's many levels or many categories in a categorical variable? Uh, our data set will get very wide, and this possibly could cause issues. And um, I'll talk about strategy for that in a little bit. So actually, I wish I had more strategies in, uh, in this lecture for this. Um, I need to expand this a little bit. I mean, the, the easiest thing that I don't have in my slides, unfortunately, is you can just say I use the K top categories. So let's say I only want to have uh, the 10 most common uh, categories and everything else I, I call into other. This means I have 11 new features for the 10 most common categories and everything else I put into other. This is one way to reduce the dimensionality. I'm going to talk about a uh, like more interesting way in a second. Um, maybe one other comment uh, on one-hot encoding. The one-hot encoding is redundant, and um, because the last column, if all the columns are zero, the last column is one. If, all the co if one of the other columns is one, the last column will be zero. So if you ha have a model that's sensitive to collinearities, that's an issue. Um, the only model that is in scikit-learn is linear regression without penalty. And there's, um, so it's, for most models, this is not actually an issue. but it, if you use um, particular kinds of models, this can be an issue. So then you can just drop one of the columns. If you have a penalized model, it actually matters which column you drop. And um, depending on what your categories mean, it can be more interpretable either to drop a column or to uh, keep all columns. Usually I, I tend to keep all the columns because the models that I usually use for them, it's, it's more interpretable. Like for penalized models, I think it's more interpretable to keep all the, uh, all the columns. If you use non-penalized models, you should drop one of them. And in a non-penalized model, it doesn't matter which one you drop. And we're going to talk about penalized and non-penalized linear models on Monday. So in principle, all tree-based models can directly use uh, discrete features. And there's also some variants of naive base that can use discrete features. Basically, no other machine learning model can, well, none of the commonly used machine learning models that are not very specific can use uh, discrete features directly. Unfortunately, in scikit-learn, um, discrete features for tree-based models are not implemented. And so you have, even if you use trees, you have to use one-hot encoding. Um, hopefully, this is going to change soon. Um, it's going to be changing soon for the last three years. But um, maybe it's actually going to change in 2019. So then you would just have to specify for the tree which columns are categorical, and it would do something else on the categorical columns. All right, so now coming to what happens if there's uh, many, many levels and um, I don't want to blow up my feature space too much. There's actually a library with a bunch of different encoding schemes that's used for, for this case, um, categorical encoding. It's in the scikit-learn contrib. We're not really going to use this, but just if you want to check out different encoding schemes. 
Um, one that I also don't have on the slides is hashing. So you can just say, okay, I'm going to hash this and I'm allowing five different uh, hash value or I add five features and um, this will allow you to reduce the dimensionality of your features but possibly including co uh, creating conflicts. One thing that people found to work really well in practice, and by practice I mean Kaggle, is uh, count-based encoding or target encoding. Um, so that's in, uh, in the categorical encoding library as leave one out encoding and as target encoding and they're slightly different. Let me talk you to the main idea. So let's say my variable is zip codes in the US. There's lots of zip codes and I don't want to encode all of them as, um, as a, a separate feature. My TAs might uh, remember, if any TAs are here, they might remember this because I asked all of them uh, when I interviewed them how they're gonna use this, solve this problem. Um, so instead of adding, well, okay, Let's say, let's say we use US zip codes, not, not states. So um, instead of adding many variables, you add just one variable that says, um, what is the average response in the zip code? So for regression, you just say, okay, I average everybody in the zip code, and uh, I average their target, and I use this average as my feature. For binary classification, you can say, in this zip code, what is the fractions of ones? If you have a multi-class classification problem, you can basically use the probability distribution in, um, in this, given this level, given this category. And so this is a very, very compressed, very low dimensional representation, because let's say, I don't know, there's like 10,000 zip codes or something, or is it 100,000, I guess, Theoretically, there's another zip codes, but now I add just one feature to encode this. This one feature says, given the zip code, what's the average outcome? So this is a very compact way that works well for very um, high categorical, high cardinality categorical variables. And I'd treat the average then as a continuous value, yes. That means I changed the categorical uh, var variable into a continuous variable, yes. I mean, basically, this assumes that the, the model cannot deal with categorical variables, um, because most models can't. I mean, you could also do this for a tree-based model that can deal with categorical variables, but if something like a zip code will be very hard even for a tree-based model, and so doing this might be useful. Uh, what does okay the question is wh when does the feature get too wide or wh wh what is too many categories and I don't think you can answer this in general um, if there's more categories than data points probably that's too wide uh, but where is the break even point probably depends on your data set and um, yeah I don't think I don't think there's a general rule, and I would try both. But if there's basically, if there's more than a hundred categories, I would probably try something like this and see if it helps. Even for 50, I might try it, but it depends on the problem whether it helps or not. So. Uh, if you do this, one thing you want to make sure is that you actually don't leak the target information because otherwise, um, assume you have only one data point in each zip code, then, then this variable will now be the target because the average of one data point is just the value. And um, so what the model will learn is this feature is a perfect predictor, just output this feature. This is a very useless model. So you don't want to do that. So what you want to do is you want to compute the average using all but this data point. If you, only, if you have one data point in every zip code, then this will be, um, 
the average will always be none or zero or something like this, and this feature will be useless. But that's fine. Your model is not going to be useless. It can still use the other features. But usually you would have more than one variable for each uh, category, and so you take the average of all the other... Uh, you have more than one sample for each category, you would take the average of all the other samples to encode one sample. So that's called, uh, like, that's a leave one out strategy, basically, because you compute the feature using leave one out. Also, my laptop's not plugged in, even though it looks like it's plugged in. It's okay. Just a brief example on what this would look like in practice. So here I'm using an adult data set that we might see again in this lecture. Um, this is, the adult data set is from a US census. So you can see there are several columns here. Um, there are the inputs. The, it's a binary classification problem where the goal is to classify whether someone makes uh, more than 50K a year or less than 50K a year. And so here, the uh, native country, country is a very high uh, ordinality categorical variable. B basically, nearly everyone is in the United States, but um, there's a long tail of different people, uh, different countries that people emigrated from. And so now for each of these countries, I can compute what is the fraction of people uh, with less than 50K and more than 50K. And um, yeah, so for, you can see that probably uh, from the Netherlands, there's not that many people, so this is a very noisy estimate, but everybody was below 50K. Um, generally, it's pretty, uh, most of the people in the data sets are below 50K, so um, usually these, the first one is bigger than the second one, but there's still some information in this. And then if I want to encode this, sorry. Okay, uh, if I want to encode this, let's say someone is from the United States, then I use the frequency of uh, them having, uh, so my feature is now, how often was someone from this country more than made more than 50K, and so whenever th it was the United States, I'm gonna replace it by 0 0.245835, and for the other countries with whatever the average, or whatever the probability was for making more than 50K. So here now, given these countries, these are the features. Right. Oh, questions about this? Okay, the question is, what does it do to interpretability? Um, I mean, the interpretation changes a lot. I wouldn't say the interpretability changes. Um, it might be even easier to interpret than having like a million features. Um, I don't know. I mean, you, you should keep that in mind when you interpret your model. But I don't think this is very, it's hard to interpret, it's just different. Uh, the question was for regression instead of classification, what would you do? I would just use the mean of y. Uh, it's a question if I have a category that's in a test set but not in the training set. Um, so basically if I have a category that's in a test set but not in the training set, there's generally very little you can do. So here you could use the mean of the whole data set, for example. Question is, uh, how about other summary statistics? And um, I haven't seen anyone use min and max, but it, clearly you can use quantile instead of this, or like a particular quantile, or any property of the distribution. So usually people use log odds, which is log of one minus log of the other, something like that. Yes. All right. I only have five minutes left, which is a little bit unfortunate. Give me one second. I want to make sure I get through the interesting bits. Okay. Um, so 
I uh, very briefly want to talk about uh, feature distributions for continuous variables. So coming back to the Boston housing data set, this is what it looks like after we scaled using the standard scaler. So now everything has zero mean and unit variance. You can see they are still have very different distributions. Here I can also look, this is a histogram um, showing the distribution of the different variables. And you can see that some of them are very heavily skewed. So here the crime rate is very skewed towards one, um, whatever. Oh, oh, this is like a, I think this is like a racial feature that is uh, pretty skewed. This is just more, more peaky, but not very Gaussian. And um, so for some models, this kind of uh, skew data can be a problem. It's mostly for linear models and some neural networks maybe. Um, and so you could try to make this data more, more well-behaved or more Gaussian. Um, this will obviously also show an, uh, change the interpretation of the model. Like if you, do, um, if you do some transformation on this, but sometimes it can be helpful to uh, make the variables more Gaussian. A very common trick is if you have count data that you apply a log to get uh, the skew out of the data. So if you have something like this, you can apply the log and it might look more Gaussian afterwards. There's a more general principle that you can use here, which is um, called power transformations. Because there's the Box-Cox transform and the Geo-Johnson transform. Here's the formula for the Box-Cox transform, which is a very commonly used one. And given a particular parameter value lambda, you transform your single variable x uh, as x to the lambda divided by lambda. That's why it's called the power transformation because you can take x to the lambda's power. For lambda equal to zero, there's a special case of um, uh, using log of x because x to the power of zero is um, one always, so that wouldn't be very interesting. Here you can see what these functions are. Basically, these are um, several uh, well, there's a logarithm, then there's several square roots, and um, then there's um, several uh, exponentials, and then things that are even sort of under the, uh, or they grow even slower than uh, logarithm. And so the idea here is to estimate this lambda from the data so that the variable will be as Gaussian as possible after this transformation. So this is um, a univariate function that's a monotonous transformation and basically you're sort of changing the scale of your data to make it more Gaussian and you uh, find the lambda to um, make it as Gaussian as possible. The Box-Cox transformation only works for positive data the Geo Johnson transformation is quite similar, but it works for positive and negative data. It has a similar effect. Both are implemented in the power transformer in scikit-learn. And so here is what happens to um, the distributions before and after. You can see here the um, it reduces the skew. This still doesn't look Gaussian, but um, the skew is like less, less intense. Here and here the skew is also less intense. Um, the skew here basically went away for these two. Um, it's not clear whether this will make a better predictive model, but uh, it's definitely something you can try for, for linear models and neural networks. If you look at um, plotting the feature against the target, you can see that for some of the things like here, the relationship actually became more linear, so it would be easier for a linear model to model this. All right, so time's up, and I guess hmm. I'm going to do two more minutes because I don't want to go back through this uh, on Monday. So. The main feature engineering I wanted to talk about is um, you can also create new features. So, for example, in this data set, um, you cannot classify this with a linear model. A linear model would be a single line. 
And so if you try to build a linear uh, classifier on this, the output would be something like this. But you can try to create this into a higher, put this into a higher dimensional space. And um, what I did here is I added a new feature that is the product of the two existing features. So I had one feature on the x-axis, one on the y-axis, and now I added a z-axis that's um, the product of the first two features. If I do this and learn a linear model in the new space, then um, I get actually this black decision boundary and I can learn the problem. So adding features that are products or uh, polynomials of original features can often help. Um, in particular, if you have a categorical variable, doing products with categorical variables is quite interesting. So let's say I have a data set similar to before. I have like several continuous variable and a categorical variable called gender. And so if I now do the, you want, I can do one hot encoding for the gender and learn a model, or I could take the product of the, uh, the gender variable with the other variables. What that means is that I have a new variable that is basically the indicator of the, ge of the gender times the rest, or t times the other feature. This corresponds to having a separate model for both genders if you have a linear model. Or you could use the original features and then add the product of the original features with the, um, with the gender feature, so then you would have a common model plus a separate model for each gender. So interaction features are very, um, good way to add features to a linear model. Actually, yeah, I'm going to run through the, I don't want to run through this too quickly, so I'm actually going to talk through this on, um, on Monday instead of rushing through it now. All right. Oh, I'm going to post the homeworks later tonight, the new homework.